take your copy of God's Word and turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be in chapter 2 this morning as we think about an exemplary uh, ministry. If you want to follow along with the bulletin right here, we'll go through, through that. Uh, well, before we, we hear God's Word uh, being preached, we're going to hear it being read. Uh, as an honor and respect for the Lord's Word, let, let us stand as we hear the Word of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much affliction. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our very own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, but we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Be seated. Let's pray. Great God, our Father, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we come into your presence, for you are good and gracious. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We thank you so much for your grace, for your presence this morning. And Lord, when we come into your presence, we know being a good God, we are aware of how far short we fall from your glory. So, God, we come confessing our sins before you now, uh, our sins of omission, our sins of commission. God, we specifically confess our, um, our lack of uh, love for your people, God, a lack of love for your word and for your glory. God, I pray that you would grow in our hearts a deeper desire to love you and to love your people. Father, we no, being a good and gracious God, you have promised in your word, even the word we read today in Psalm 103, that you will cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, uh, that we uh, would be forgiven all of our sins through Christ. So, God, we thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus that forgives us, that cleanses us from all our sins. Uh, Father, we lift up those in our congregation who are hurting this morning. We lift up uh, Chris DeBose and his back surgery uh, upcoming. God, we pray that you would just be with them this week as he has the spinal tap, God, we pray that you would just be merciful and gracious to both Chris and Whitney. Uh, we pray for uh, Ken Tatter, God. It's so great to see him here uh, in the morning, Father. We pray that you would continue to strengthen him by your grace. God, continue to allow him to, uh, to uh, get strength back from these chemo treatments. And God, we thank you for Jerry Green and his presence with us. We pray that you would continue to give him a steadfast joy, uh, even in the midst of uh, no energy. God, we pray that you would restore his energy, that he could continue to serve you in the life of this church. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It goes forth every single week, and not only from this pulpit, but pulpits across this town. Uh, we pray this morning for Jay Hardwick at North Rock Hill. We pray as he preaches the word of God uh, that he be preached powerfully, God, uh, not in his own strength, but in the strength that you supply, that that congregation will become more and more like Christ, that will reflect your character. And Father, now we pray for our own hearts as we are about to hear the word uh, Father, I, I pray now, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive your word. Lord, I pray against the discouragement I feel uh, in, in the congregation. God, I pray that we would receive your word with gladness and with joy, knowing that you are a powerful and almighty God, that you are a God who loves to, to show yourself strong and mighty in your people. So, God, we pray this morning as we declare and, and announce your word, God, as we herald your word from this pulpit, that we pray that the Holy Spirit would attend it and press it upon our hearts, that we would be formed and shaped in your likeness to do 
a ministry built in a way that would give you honor and glory. So, God, we pray that even on a day like today, you would do much more than we could possibly ask or imagine. That we would continue to be faithful to hear and to preach your word until your church is built. So, Father, we love you. And we pray that you would be with your people this hour. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, during one of the famed apologist Ravi Zacharias' lectures, uh, he recalls a time uh, when he was giving a, a lecture uh, at Ohio State uh, University. Uh, he, he said this. He says, I was a minute away from beginning my lecture, and my host was driving me past the new building called the Wexner Center for the Performing Arts. He said, this is America's first postmodern building. I was startled for a moment. I said, what is a postmodern building? He said, well, the architect said that he designed the building with no design in mind. When the architect was asked why, he said, if life itself is capricious, why should our buildings have any design or any meaning? So he has pillars that have no purpose. He has stair- stairways that go nowhere. He has senseless building built and somebody has paid for it. I said, so his argument was that if life had no purpose and design, why should the building have any design? He said, that is, that is correct. And then I said, did he do the same with the foundation? All of a sudden, there was silence. You see, you and I can fool with the infrastructure as much as we would like, but we dare not fool with the foundation because it will call our bluff in a hurry. One day, beloved, our foundation, the foundation of our lives, will call our bluff. What we have chosen to build our lives on will be exposed. The Apostle Paul built his ministry on a firm foundation. He warns us to take care how we build because one day our foundation will be revealed. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 10 through 15. It's a set of scripture that really caused, caused me to shudder when I, when I read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 10 through 15. Paul writes, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Implying that we're all builders that we are all going to build. So each one of us needs to take care how we build. Then he says this, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, that day, will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test What sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Very simple. Take care how you build. And we think about the church, the life and the ministry of the church. Who's responsible to build? Pastors, deacons, evangelists, all Christians. I think what you see in, in both this passage here and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that all Christians are responsible for building. We know that pastors and teachers, what we're doing right this minute is to equip you for the work of the ministry. Not to, to do the ministry ourselves, but to equip you to do the work of the ministry. We are all called to ministry. And since we are all called to ministry, we better make sure that we know how to build and know what to build with. If we want to be an exemplary church, and that is my prayer, that we would become an exemplary church, that people would look at us and they would see a church that submits to the Lord Jesus Christ in everything, that we need to do our ministry and need to build that ministry on the right thing. Learning from the Apostle Paul, I think this morning we can learn three things on what we can build our ministry with. 
All of us, not just this church's ministry, but you individually have a ministry. Every single person has been gifted by God for the building up of the body of Christ. So the number one, we build with God's word. We build with God's word. So we're in 1 Thessalonians, and in Acts chapter 16, we read how Paul and Silas were beaten and jailed for casting out an evil spirit from a slave girl. Uh, the people who, uh, who owned the slave girl got mad because their, their, their idea that they weren't going to get any more money, so they, they, they took the, the crowd and they stirred up dissension and said, these men are against the laws of the land. And they started attacking Paul and Silas. They beat him. The magistrates jumped in and they ordered them to be formally beat and then sent to prison. Not giving them a trial, even accords with Roman law. Well, you know how the story goes. There was an earthquake and Paul and Silas's uh, uh, um, chains are unfastened. But instead of running, they stay there. And the, the Philippian jailer was about to take his own life. And they said, don't do it, we're here. And Philippian jailer and his family were, were saved that very day. So right after that, right after they were shamefully treated, right, and they, they were put in prison and beaten with, with no trial, they came to Thessalonica. The story we have, the chapter, the, the book we're looking at today. Our lives are not isolated events. Our, our past impacts our present. The Bible is full of real people and with real past. So Paul and Silas and Timothy were just beaten and jailed for sharing their faith. So they had to ask themselves a question. Should we continue sharing the gospel? They were just beaten. They were just jailed. The government endorsed it, giving them no trial. Should we continue to preach the gospel? Well, we know from the text that by God's grace they did. Look at the text again, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. It says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but through though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. They had already suffered, they had already been shamefully treated, but that did not stop them from building with the Word of God. They kept sharing the Gospel in the face of much conflict. See, the message of the Gospel was so precious and so valuable to them, they couldn't not but share it. The phrase, we had boldness in our God, could be interpreted two different ways. It could mean that God gave them strength to, to be bold in, in sharing the, the gospel. It could be that they, they shared it knowing that, they were, that God was going to give them strength to do it. Either way, both are true. But these, mess, these missionaries treasured the gospel so much, they could do nothing else but to share it. And I wonder for us, not only the people here, but as a church in America, do we treasure the gospel? David Livingstone was a famous missionary in the 19th century England. Uh, he was trained in me me uh, medicine and later became a medical missionary to Africa. Uh, he spent a little over 30 years in Africa. Uh, he loved Africa and he loved the African people. Well, he died on May 4th, 1873 uh, of malaria. And when he died, he had two people with him, uh, two of his loyal servants, uh, Chuma and Susi. And they decided right there to cut out his heart. They cut out his heart and they buried his heart right underneath the tree where he died. His body was buried in England, the place where he was born. But his heart was buried in Africa, the place where he loved. Now, friend, this morning, if, you, if your heart were to be buried in the place where you loved during your life, where would it be? Bank account, entertainment, your family. Where is your heart? God wants your heart 
God wants your, 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 your greatest treasure to be Him. The reason that Paul and Silas, I believe, were able to preach in the midst of much conflict was because their heart was set on Jesus and on the people that God had called them to reach. See, their willingness to suffer was proof that they came with pure motives. Look what it says in verse 3 and 4. The word for there, that, that first word in verse 3, is a connection to the previous one. They were willing to suffer, and they said, the reason why you can trust what we said is because of our suffering. So it says, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God, who tests our hearts. They knew the risks. They knew the risk of sharing the gospel. They knew that they could be beaten or jailed again. But what other choice did they have? Their master and their creator had entrusted them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they spoke. Beloved, you are a Christian. And if you are a Christian, God has entrusted you with the gospel. So you must speak. Not to please man, but to please Christ. The approval of God is the only one that matters. And what pleases God is when His people cherish and share His good news. You know, God created this world good and man fell into sin. Sin has separated us from God and spreading death to all men, for all have sin. And man became enemies of God. The message of the Gospel is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent His forth His Son to live and die in our place. He became our, our substitute on the cross. He paid for our crimes. And after His death, He was placed in the tomb and God raised Him from the dead. And in His resurrection, He, he proves that Jesus Christ really was the Son of God. That if we believe in Him, if we trust in His death and His resurrection on our behalf, that God will give us a resurrection. That we will be taken up with Him in glory. If you're here and you're a non-Christian, have you ever considered why so many Christians are willing to suffer to share the message of Jesus? Why would someone risk so much pain simply to share a message? Could it be that it's true? You know, Paul was one who, who used to go from town to town to, to persecute and punish those who shared this message. And then he himself became one who was willing to, to be beaten to share this wonderful message. I pray that you would consider the history of Christian persecution as a sign of its truthfulness. My old pastor said the reason why he became a Christian was because he couldn't make sense um, of, of the world of Christianity without the, res without the resurrection. If the resurrection truly happened, that's the only reason why these, these men, these apostles, were willing to suffer so much. They saw the living Christ. Well, Christian, are you willing to build your life on the message of the gospel? It is not enough to merely live a good life before outsiders. We must speak. I think there's kind of this, this, this lie that kind of goes around Christianity sometimes. It just says that all, all that matters is how I live. If Paul came to Thessalonica and he just lived a good life, what would have happened to him? Nothing. If he went to Philippi and just lived a good life, what would have happened to him? Nothing. But God has not called his people just to live a good life. He's called us to speak. To speak the gospel. To share the gospel. And the message of the gospel is offensive. So Christian, do you believe in the message of the gospel? Are you willing to share it? Not to please men, but to please God. To test your hearts. Everybody here has been given a ministry. Everyone here has been entrusted with the gospel of Christ. The question is, is, will you speak? Will you live for the gospel? If you love the gospel, if you love the gospel, you would want to share it. Maybe the reason 
that we don't share the gospel. And maybe it's a lot simpler than we think. Maybe we simply don't treasure it. Maybe we simply don't believe it. One day, beloved, our foundation will be exposed and judged. Are you building with the sweet word of the gospel? The second thing we want to build with is a godly witness. So we build with God's word, then we build with godly, a godly witness. Now, we're not merely called to be good witnesses, but we are called to be good witnesses. The message is connected to the messenger. People will not believe the message unless they believe the one who brings it. Paul highlights again and again throughout this letter how he lived among the Thessalonians. Not to prop up himself, but to prop up the message. They would believe the message of the gospel. Our godly lives are just prongs that lift up the the gospel jewel. Look at verses 5 through 8. Paul testifies to his own internal and external witness. Verse 5, he says, For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother caring for her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with, with you not only the gospel of God, but also our very own selves. Because we have become, you have become very dear to us. In the text, we see that Paul and his companions didn't do, did not do three things. They didn't come with words of flattery. They didn't come seeking money. And they didn't come seeking glory. No words of flattery. No money. And no glory. And sadly, when I look around the evangelical world today, that's exactly what I see. Paul knew he was representing God and God's message. So he knew that his conduct as a messenger was vastly important. They did not come with demands, but they came as servants. But we also see what they did do, what these men did do among the Thessalonians. They were gentle. They were gentle like a nursing mother with her own children. They were tender and they were delicate. Why? They loved them. They love the Thessalonians. Our lack of gentleness, hear me, our lack of gentleness with young or immature Christians is actually a sign that we don't love them. It's a sign of a lack of love. Paul was gentle because he loved them. So when we're we're, we're not gentle, we are not being loving. When we love people, we are willing to patiently endure with them. I mean, I have noticed in my own heart, in my own life, that my own frustrations say more about me than they do about those who I'm frustrated with. So when you're frustrated with people, it's probably God and his kindness revealing something about your own life, about your own lack of gentleness. An exemplary ministry is built on being ready to share not only the gospel of God, but our very own selves. We have to be willing to invest our lives into others. Relationships are messy, but they're worth it. They are worth it. A few weeks ago, I was um, at a uh, camp out with my son. And uh, one of the, the men there was a, a member of another church. And I looked at him. I just asked him, what is, the, what is your favorite thing about the church that you attend? I love asking these questions. What's the favorite thing about the church that you attend? Uh, ours would be we have too many redheads, right? Uh, he, he, said, he said, you know, I love that our pastor every single week preaches the word of God. Amen. And he says, and I also just love how God has given us a sweet community among our people. He said, I've been part of this church for a lot of years. And about a year and a half ago, I was so frustrated with our church. I mean, I'd read the Bible and I'd see that we're called to live our, our lives together. They're called to be intimately connected. I see that all in the New Testament, but I didn't see it in our own church. So I was so mad that I, I finally, me and my wife, we went to our pastor's house and we just vented. We just, for 30 minutes, we just we talked about everything that was wrong with our church and all these problems. And in the midst of us venting, it became very clear to us that we were the problem. 
that we were the ones not investing. We were the ones not reaching out to people. We were the ones who were not willing to give our own selves because we had too many other commitments and too many other priorities that we couldn't invest in relationships. Uh, he said, now it's very different. He said, now we, we, we see people maybe three or four times a week. And that's not a burden. It's a joy. Right? And there, are, there's like, there, there are days when, of course, I, wanna, I don't want to see people. <laughs> I'd rather just uh, be at home alone. But God has given us a sweet community. And every time I invest in others, man, I'm, I'm paid back tenfold. Beloved, what he said is so true in our lives. You know, I think the, the danger of uh, what's going on in, in our world is, you know, I often think about the technological developments that have happened. And, you know, a lot of them are very good, but a lot of them really stifle true community. You know, we think about, um, you know, smartphones. They're, they're, they're great for quick communication, but they often rob people of face-to-face contact. You know, the television, the Internet are great for entertainment and information, but also encourage isolation and anonymity. Uh, cars allow for easy transportation over thousands of miles, and yet they cause our lives to be so spread out that we can't find time for real community. An exemplary ministry is one that is interconnected with one another. We have to know each other. Paul said that I was willing to not only share with you the gospel, but my very life. Are we willing to do the same with one another? Are we willing to share our lives? Now, the easiest way to do that is just meet together. We give you opportunities as a church family, Sunday morning, Sunday school, worship, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Come early, stay later, talk, interact with one another. Those are great opportunities to build, build relationships. But I think if we're going to take it to the next level, and we are going to be a church that is interconnected, relationally tight, I, I think that we need more time with one another. That's why we've developed small groups. Right? These, these idea of community groups. We've kind of spaced them out all throughout Rock, Rock Hill and Fort Mill so that you can meet in people's homes, get to know one another, study the scriptures, and just interconnect your lives. Imagine how different Sunday morning would be if we knew each other really, really well. We can't do that. We can't do good ministry with one another. And primarily, church, the ministry that God has called you to do is with each other. <laughs> it's with the church. You know, think about, I mean, you tell me all, all the time about how church uh, here used to be. This was a mill hill, right? So the, the Highland Park Mill is up there, and everybody lived in this community. <laughs> so what did you do? I hear stories all the time. People just walk to church. You'd see whole streets packed with people walking to Park Baptist Church. Well, now most people don't live in the neighborhood. We're spread out all over the place. So we have to be intentional with our lives, ordering and structuring our lives so that we can have interconnectivity. We are a corporate body full of individual families. And how you conduct your individual family will affect our corporate body. If you as an individual unit choose to invest relationally with the people in this congregation, you will have tangential effects for years down the road. Jesus Christ said, a new command I give you, love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When people come into our church and they experience a deep love for one another, we show that the gospel is true. We show that the gospel is real. So you may think that it's a very simple thing to show up at a house on Tuesday to pray for each other and, and study the word together. But you may not realize by doing that on, in September, you may be helping someone be saved in May. Because they're able to see a better picture of the gospel. This is not small potatoes. We're talking about people's eternal destiny. Jesus says, if you love each other, if you love each other well, the world will know that you are mine. Think about that. So yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a system. It's a program. We want you to, to, to get together, be intentional in those relationships. If you can make it, get into a small group. Get into a community group. If you can't, have dinner with people. Read the Bible together. Develop those relationships with one another. We will never become an exemplary church unless we know one another. Just read the accounts of the New Testament. They didn't meet twice a week. They met daily. We can all rejoice in the ways that all this technology can benefit our lives. We have to use it to harness ways to develop relationships. Um, well, the last thing, let me close here. We build with a godly work. We build with godly work. Uh, 
I said in a small group this past week that uh, the Christian life is simple, but it's not easy. Uh, I think churches have sold the world, uh, America, a bill of goods uh, by lowering the bar of Christian commitment. Uh, Jesus said, um, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The command is simple, isn't it? Follow me. That's all Jesus asks of you. (laughs) Follow me. That's the command of the Christian life. That's a very simple command. But it is not easy. You must deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow Jesus. And we even see the the difficulty of that hard life here in this passage. Look at chapter uh, 2, verse 9 through 12. Paul says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. How often do you think about your Christian life as labor and toil? You know, most people look for, at, at church as, man, is, what, are we going to have fun today? <laughs> How many times do you say, yeah, Christ, the, Christ, the Christian church is about labor and toil? For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. While we proclaim to you the gospel of God, you are witnesses, and God also, of how holy and righteous and blameless our conduct was towards you believers. For you know how, and I love this, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. They did not come with demands for money. They did not come looking for glory. What did they came to do? They came to work. Now, Paul, by, by trade, was a tent maker, so he probably used that trade or, or something similar to, to provide for his food and his uh, lodging cost so that he wouldn't be a burden to anybody. But he was willing to work night and day. My high school basketball coach, bless his heart, used to always tell me that what's lacking, uh, what's lacking in me, <laughs> lacking in, in my team, was intestinal fortitude, strength, an inner strength that you were willing to work hard. When I look around the world, I see a lack of intestinal fortitude. Are we willing to labor night and day? See, Paul was willing to labor night and day. Why? Because he said that God calls us into his own kingdom and glory. He knew that there was a day coming when he was going to be called to God. He was going to face Jesus Christ in the eyes. And he also knew that, that the people under his care were going to do the same thing. Beloved, your job is to do ministry. Your job is to do ministry. That's why I'm here to equip you to do that work, to give you the knowledge, to give you the the, the understanding of the Scriptures so that you can be more faithful in that work. But you are going to stand before God one day for your work. Your work is going to be judged. He's going to call us. He's going to call us. And he knew that his behavior mattered. Look what he says in in verse 10. You are witnesses in God also of how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. Don't you just love that as as a father with his children? How he exhorted each one of you, encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. How great would it be if the people of Park Baptist Church walked in a manner worthy of God? as we all look forward to that day when he calls us into his own kingdom and glory. William Wilberforce was not a pastor. He was a church member. He loved Jesus and he loved the church. He worked tirelessly in the public sector to end the slave trade in England. After another bitter defeat, after ten, ten long years in this battle, he was frustrated. And he was discouraged. He opened his Bible and a letter fell out. Written from his friend, John Wesley, who recently passed away. He picked it up and he read it again. This is what the letter said. Unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in imposing that practice of slavery, which is the scandal of religion of England, and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, 
you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? All, are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might. Beloved, God has raised you up for one another. God has called us all to ministry. He has called us all to minister to one another as, <clears throat> so that we will receive the crown of righteousness on that day when God calls us into his own kingdom and glory. If we want to become an exemplary church, then we must all, all of us, build our own ministries on the word with a godly witness and with God-honoring hard work. Let us not become weary in well-doing. Let us go in the name of God and the power of his might. Let's pray. Father, help us build our ministries with the word, with a godly witness, and with God honoring hard work. For our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.